Good evening. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. And I want to thank the University of Denver, the leadership of the university, and the faculty and the students uh, for having me here. It's really a great privilege to be here, uh, in particular to come back home. Uh, since I, I left the United States two years ago, I've taken this position at the London School of e Economics. Uh, my assignment today, tonight, is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult because I will be talking about two particular themes, two particular really topics, not just one topic. The first one is a broken Middle East. That is, I want to talk about, tell you a bit about what's happening in the region, in particular in the last 10 years. And what I mean by broken, I mean institutionally broken. The Middle East is an institutional wasteland. So this is, this is a central uh, theme of my talk tonight. Uh, another theme of my assignment tonight is the impact of the war on terror, our own war on terror in the United States, on Middle Eastern politics and also on US foreign policy since 9-11. Uh, that is, what has been the impact of the US global war on terror on American foreign policy and the Middle East itself? To what extent has the US war on terror uh, deepened the cleavages and the divide in the Middle East itself? That is, uh, to what extent has the war, the American global war on terror, has been counterproductive, has been counterproductive to uh, uh, basically uh, preserving American uh, interests in the region? And finally, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? That is, since I will argue that the Middle East is broken, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Where do we go uh, from here? Everything I say here is really open to debate and discussion, as you know. And I would be delighted at the end of, of, the, of my uh, talk to answer any questions that some of you have sent. And keep it in mind that this is basically, I'm going to put some provoking arguments, just arguments. And I do hope that some of the questions try to deconstruct some of the arguments uh, I will make uh, tonight. I want to start with the subtitle of my talk, that is a wasted decade on, uh, uh, on terror. Uh, uh, that is, I want to talk about my argument, my basic argument uh, uh, tonight is that uh, this is not a polemical question. When I say that our war on terror since 9-11 uh, has been wasted, I'm not really putting on the table a polemical question. This goes to the very heart of what I call faulty and catastrophic analytical decisions made by our policymakers after 9-11. And I'm going to put some of the ideas to make the case why our war has been very counterproductive in the pursuit of American interests against Al-Qaeda and larger interests. I don't have to remind you, as you well know, probably you know more than I do, that the war on terror, the American war on terror, has cost so far almost $5 trillion. We have spent so far in direct and indirect cost on the war more than $5 trillion in terms of homeland security, in terms of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan, in terms of the creation of a national security complex, a national security complex that has cost more than $1 trillion since 9-11. But before I do that, let's talk about the nature of the threat that the United States faced on the morning after 9-11. Let's see what kind of enemy we faced after 9-11. At the height of its power, at the height of its power, Al-Qaeda, what we call transnational jihad, a transnational jihadist movement, never numbered more than 3,000 fighters or militants. At the height of its power in the late 1990s, the United States faced a very insidious enemy that numbered between 3,000 and 4,000 fighters. I'm not suggesting that 3,000 fighters are not dangerous. We know that all it, takes on nine, all it took on 9-11, 19 suicide bombers that brought death uh, uh, to American shores. Most of those 3,000 fighters were concentrated in one area of the world, that is in Afghanistan. Most of Al-Qaeda fighters, militants, extremists, were in one part of the world in 
Afghanistan. The question for us, for the United States of America, how do we basically fight? How do we retaliate? How do we take care of the challenge that we face, faced after 9-11? Do we declare all-out war? Do we declare all-out war against this particular enemy that numbered 3,000 fighters and located in one geostrategic, one geographic place in Afghanistan? Or do we pursue a different kind of strategy? Because remember, Al-Qaeda does not really, is not a conventional army. This is, you're talking about roving bands. You're talking about militants organized in cells. Do we declare a conventional all-out war and basically try to destroy Al-Qaeda and its allies? Or do we somehow build alliances and find an unconventional war in the same way that Al-Qaeda uh, fought uh, the United States. Another question faced American decision makers, was Al-Qaeda a limited, small, insidious challenge, or was Al-Qaeda part of an ideological, a broader ideological enemy that basically challenged the United States uh, since the mid-1990s? That is, did Osama bin Laden speak for the 1. Point, uh, 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 billion Muslims? Did Osama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri, his second in command, speak for Islamists? Islamists are those activists, you're talking about multiple Islamists. You have mainstream Islamists, you have radical Islamists, and you have militant Islamists. Al-Qaeda is part of the militant Islamist movement. And as I argue, and those are not my numbers. The numbers when I say Al-Qaeda numbered 3,000 fighters, those are the numbers of consensus within the American intelligence community, independent scholars, and all the research shows that on 9-11, Al-Qaeda did not number more than uh, 3,000 uh, fighters. Let me now make the case of why Al-Qaeda was a much insignificant, more of a security irritant and nuisance than existential threat. I want to make the case and I want to put some points on the table to show you that instead of looking at Al-Qaeda, please keep in mind, I'm not saying Al-Qaeda is not dangerous. I'm not saying that Al-Qaeda should not have been tackled by the United States. All I am saying that did the challenge that the United States faced on the morning after 9-11, was it an existential threat? or was it more of a security irritant and nuisance that basically required, required a different type of response. Let's see whether Al-Qaeda spoke for not only the Muslim community, but even for the Islamist movement. In fact, my argument is that Al-Qaeda did not speak for the Islamist movement. The Islamist movement in the larger Middle East numbers between 20 and 25% of Muslim populations, let's say if you have elections in Egypt today, probably 20% of the population in Egypt would vote for the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is the most powerful Islamist organization in Egypt. So let's say in even Hamas, Hamas is part of the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine, you have between 20 and 30% of Palestinians in, on the West Bank and Gaza would vote for Hamas the same way with the Islamists in Jordan. You have about between 20 and 25%. Radical Islamists like Hezbollah of Lebanon numbers about 10% of the Islamist movement. Al-Qaeda, the militant Islamist movement, I would argue it's less than 1% of the Islamist movement subscribed to this ideology called uh, militant uh, uh, Islamism. In fact, the ideology of militant Islamists, the ideology of transnational jihad, really did not burst into the scene till the mid-1990s. Al-Qaeda, the transnational jihad, what we're talking about today, did not really come into being till the mid-1990s. Yet, the militant Islamist movement was born in the late 1950s in Egypt. And for some of us, for some of us researchers who work on the movement, the question, why did Al-Qaeda burst into the scene, the Muslim scene, in the mid-1990s and not in the 1950s, or 1960s, or 1970s, or 1990s. This is a very legitimate question, because it tells us about the point I'm trying to address. It tells us about the nature of the threat that the United States faced on 9-11. Uh, 
In fact, one of the reasons why Al-Qaeda burst into the scene, the Muslim scene in the mid 1990s, because the militant Islamist movement in Muslim societies was strategically defeated on the battlefield in Egypt, in Algeria, in Saudi Arabia, and everywhere. So the fact is, by the mid 1990s, the militant Islamist movement that targeted Arab and Muslim leaders was strategically defeated on the battlefield, and you have a tiny section of the militant movement led by a person called Ayman Zawahiri decided to join the global jihad against the United States of America and its close allies. When Ayman Zawahiri, and please bear with me, I'm gonna put some, give you some just simple history to give you, to, to contextualize my argument, and then I'll come back to the, the major uh, themes of my argument. When Ayman Zawahiri decided to join Osama bin Laden in the mid to late 1990s, he tried to convince his own organization, his organization called Egyptian Islamic Jihad. He said, I want us to join Osama bin Laden and change, transform jihad from against Arab and Muslim leaders into a struggle against the United States. Ayman Zawahiri faced a revolt within his own organization, Egyptian Islamic Jihad. Most of his field lieutenants, some of whom I interviewed in Egypt and Yemen, basically made the case, how can we take on the United States of America, even though we were defeated by own, our go by own governments in Egypt and Algeria? In fact, Ayman Zawahiri himself faced a revolt within his own organization, the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, because most of the people within the Islamist movement were not convinced that taking on the United States of America would be really uh, productive. After all, it would be a suicide, suicidal undertaking on the part of the uh, uh, Islamist uh, movement. Ayman Zawahiri made the case in the late 1990s. He said, look, the reason why we were defeated by our own governments because we failed to win hearts and minds in the Muslim world. We failed to convince Muslim populations in Egypt, in Algeria, in Saudi Arabia that we had a vision, a blueprint to transform our societies. The only way, the only way we can reverse this particular struggle is to target the United States of America. He called America the head of the snake. And when we, ta when we target the United States of America, the United States would lash out angrily against the Islamic community. And when the United States lashes out angrily against uh, the Muslim community, we would stand up and defend the Muslim community. We would gain credibility in the eyes of the Ummah. In late in 1999, in one of the memos that was captured in Afghanistan, Ayman Zawahiri made the case to his own militants who were not convinced that targeting the United States was a good idea, that the only way, the only way to survive, the only way to rescue the sinking militant ship was to target the United States because the United States would lash out, lash out angrily against the Muslim Ummah and we would stand up and defend the Muslim community, we would gain credibility, we would have a social base. The whole idea, what am I, why am I trying, why am I burdening you with these particular details? Two points. The major targets on 9-11, the primary audience was not the United States of America. The primary target on 9-11 was back home, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in Algeria, in Jordan. The major goal of Ayman Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden was not to defeat the United States of America. They're not stupid, they're very intelligent people. They realized that they cannot win a war against the greatest power in the world. They wanted to trigger a response from the United States. They wanted the United States to lash out angrily against the Muslim community in that part of the world. They wanted to stand up and defend the Ummah, the Muslim community. They wanted to win hearts and minds. What I'm trying to say is that Ayman Zawahi and Osama bin Laden, they were interested in seizing power at home, in capturing power at home. They were not interested in defeating the United States State of America. Their entire strategy, the entire strategy of Al-Qaeda from the late 1990s to the present was to win Muslim hearts and mind, to basically to equal the playing field against their own Muslim leaders in order to seize power at home. Their own, their own strategy was based on how the United States would respond to the attacks against the homeland uh, on 9-11. That is, that is a very, very important to keep in mind. The second point, 
This is the first point I want to make. Let's talk about, because remember, my point is our policymakers our, made the calculation that Al-Qaeda was not just a security irritant, Al-Qaeda was part of a broader ideological struggle, basically waged against the United States in that part of the world, that the threat itself was not just led by Al-Qaeda, it was bigger, broader, more insidious. Let's talk about the Taliban. I mentioned the point, my, my, my first point is that within his own movement, Ayman Zawahiri, within the Islamist movement, most of his lieutenants were not convinced that targeting the United States was a good idea. The argument was made it would be a suicidal uh, mission on the part of, the, uh, of, of, the, of Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden. How many of us know that in the late 1990s, the Shura Council within the Taliban, the consultation, it's the ruling council of the Taliban, decided to basically either expel Osama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri from Afghanistan or kill him and get rid of him because they were becoming a burden on the Taliban movement in Afghanistan. Yes, absolutely. The Taliban sheltered and provided a safe haven for Al-Qaeda and the Arab contingent in Afghanistan from the mid-1990s up to 2001. But the Taliban, regardless of what we think of the Taliban, regardless of how regressive, regardless of how anti-democratic, regardless of how reckless they were, the Taliban have never, have never waged a global jihad, have never carried out a single attack against outside of their own borders, the United States. Our entire government has never accused the Taliban from either carrying a global jihad or even one single attack against the United States. What I'm trying to suggest is that even within Afghanistan itself, in the late 1990s, the Taliban leadership was fully aware that Al-Qaeda was becoming a major liability for the uh, Taliban movement and the Islamic Emirates and the government. You say, why they didn't expel Al-Qaeda? In fact, a majority of the Taliban ruling council voted to expel Al-Qaeda from uh, uh, Afghanistan. Only the leader of the Taliban, and again, I'm what everything I'm saying is based on information we got, we captured after the invasion of Afghanistan. Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban, vetoed the decision by the majority of the Taliban, and in fact, he warned Osama bin Laden not to plan any attacks from Afghanistan against the United States or even Saudi Arabia. More than once, Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban, ordered Osama bin Laden not to carry out or even plot any attacks uh, against the United States. Well, we know now that Mullah Omar, naive Mullah Omar, was no match for the Arabian fox, Osama bin Laden. We know that uh, Osama bin Laden stabbed the Taliban movement in the back, and many Taliban leaders never, have never forgiven the, the Al-Qaeda for what Al-Qaeda did to the Taliban movement. Another point what I'm trying to say is that even in Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda was not part of an alliance in Afghanistan. The Taliban were not really part of the global jihad waged against the United States since the late 1990s. Al-Qaeda was a small, limited, dangerous, insidious security irritant as opposed to being part of a broader alliance against the United States of America. And what did we do after 9-11? The decision was made that Al-Qaeda was a greater threat than it was. We decided to uh, unleash a major war. Uh, we called it the, the global war on terror. We invaded uh, Iraq, not only in order to defeat, not only in order to defeat Al-Qaeda, but in order to basically social engineer a change in that part of the world. Let's, stay, let's talk about Iraq itself. The argument, I mean, the reason why Many Americans were convinced that Al-Qaeda was part of a larger threat because the argument was made, as you all know, between 2001 and 2003 or 4, that Iraq itself had a hand in the 9-11 attacks. In fact, up to 2004, a majority of Americans believed that the late President Saddam Hussein basically had a major say, a major 
part in the plot against uh, the United States. And that's why, I mean, I think in many ways it influenced the debate in the United States about whether we should invade uh, Iraq uh, or not. We did exactly what, what I'm trying to say, is that our strategy played directly into the hands of Ayman Zawahi and Osama bin Laden. Instead of fighting Al-Qaeda on our own terms, instead of building alliances with the Muslim community in order to defeat Al-Qaeda from within, what did we do? We lashed out angrily against some Muslim Arab states that really had nothing to do uh, with Al-Qaeda. This was the threat on the morning after. Let's see where we are today. And please remember, I'm simplifying a great deal. Really, I'm talking more of anecdotes rather really in, in, in narratives. Here we are today, 10 years after 9-11. Let's see the nature of the threat. If my reading is correct, if Al-Qaeda was 3,000 fighters on 9-11, what are we doing today in the larger and the greater Middle East and the Muslim world? Now we are deeply embroiled in a truly global multiple wars on multiple theaters. We are fighting a major two major uh, wars in Afghanistan and Pakistan. We are fighting another you know, limited campaign in Iraq itself. We have another major front in Somalia, another theater emerging now in, uh, in Yemen, um, and other uh, uh, theaters as well. On 9-11, we faced 3,000 insidious militants. Today, we face major social movements, both in Afghanistan and Pakistan. The Taliban now has risen, has basically become a major force. I don't know about you, but I myself, any, any student of strategy, I take Al-Qaeda anytime as a threat, as a challenger, as an enemy to major social movements in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And when we're talking about Pakistan, we're talking about a nuclear armed state. Uh, uh, I mean, the threat was Osama bin Laden on 9-11 now we are facing major social movements. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of enemies deeply embroiled in the shifting sands of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Iraq, let's look about Iraq, what has happened as a result of our own analytical miscalculation on the morning after 9-11. We invaded Iraq to do what? To social engineer change in the Arab world. To do what? To plant Jeffersonian seeds of democracy in the Arabian heartland. To do what? To weaken Iran and isolate Iran and destroy Iran and destroy the Syrian regimes in order to make the Middle East safe for the American model for democracy and capitals. What have we done in Iraq? No, I'm serious. This is really, what, what are we today in Iraq? I want you to know, and we were talking about earlier, Iraq is as dangerous as Afghanistan and Pakistan. It's one of the most dangerous countries in the world. There is, we impose a sectarian-based system on the country. The country is deeply divided along sectarian lines. The country is, I mean, could easily plunge into multiple civil wars between the Kurds and the Shiites, between the Shiites and the Sunnis. I mean, I I Iraq remains work in progress. You have 50% chance of either, I mean, the country surviving as it is or splintering in the future. What has happened to Iraq? Because remember, one of the major goals of our invasion of Iraq was to weaken. The most powerful state in Iraq today is not the United States of America. The most powerful state in Iraq today is Iran. Iran, as a result of our own miscalculation on the morning after, is now the unrivaled regional power in the Gulf itself. Have we made Iraq safe for democracy? In fact, Iraq has become really, we, it exports sectarianism and turmoil from the Gulf to Lebanon to other places in the Middle East uh, itself. What has happened to Al-Qaeda itself? Al-Qaeda in 2003 was almost uh, destroyed as a result of the American you know, campaign, as a result of collaboration of America's allies in Pakistan, uh, in Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, our European allies, uh, look what we have today. We have a small, little Al-Qaeda center in the Pakistan's tribal areas. We're talking about 200, between 200 and 300 men. 
Al-Qaeda on 9-11, there were 3,000 men. Al-Qaeda now is down to 200, 300 uh, roving bands in Pakistan's tribal areas along the Afghanistan border. But at the same time now, we have an Al-Qaeda branch in Yemen. According to American intelligence, the Al-Qaeda branch in Yemen is as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than Al-Qaeda central in the Pakistan tribal areas. You have Al-Qaeda branch in multiple areas. In Saudi Arabia, you have Al-Qaeda branch in, 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 in various parts of the world. Not only that, the most dangerous part is not just Al-Qaeda, because Al-Qaeda really now is a, is a, a, you might say, a skeleton of what it used to be. Now you have homegrown radicalization and extremism. That is, our expansion of the war on terror has created what I call really a backlash, created a, a spillover effect into our own Western societies, including more than dozens of Americans who basically believe that the United States is waging a war against Islam and Muslims. You know, the narrative in the United States, I mean, uh, uh, and this is not, uh, I'm talking, not I'm talking about, I don't think we invaded Iraq, uh, you know, uh, because we, we, we wanted to wage a crusade against uh, Islam and Muslims. Of course, that's not true. Uh, it was more of, uh, more of, what I call a catastrophic analytical decision on the part of our, that in that part of the world, there's a deeply entrenched set of beliefs that the United States invaded Iraq in order to siphon the resources, the oil resources of Iraq, in order to subjugate uh, and dominate uh, the Muslim lands. In this particular sense, I mean, America's moral standing uh, has been damaged a great deal as a result <coughs> of what has happened in the region. I want to come now, talk about the second part of my talk, A Broken Middle East. How much time do I have? Okay. Has, our, how, has our global war made the Middle East a democratic, a more democratic uh, region? That is, have our actions promoted human rights and the rule of law and democracy uh, in that part of the world? Let's look at the Middle East today. I mean, you have President uh, Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, who has been in power for 30 years. You have President Ali Abdullah Saleh in Yemen, who has been in power for 31 years. You have the Gulf sheikdoms who are in power forever, because uh, you have family-based states throughout the Middle East. And that's what I meant, that the Middle East is an institutional uh, uh, wasteland, truly is an institutional wasteland. If we were really genuine, if we are really genuine about promoting a change in the Middle East, the first thing you do is not to talk about the promotion of democracy. The first thing you do, you talk about institutional building. You talk about the rule of law. You talk about human rights. Uh, those are the building blocks of democracy. I don't need to remind you, you know more than I do that uh, in order to construct a democracy, it takes about 100 years. I mean, most of political theorists believe that the lifespan of a democracy is 100 years. Uh, so what, if, if we really, if we were, if we are, if we have been genuine about the promotion of democracy in that part of the world, we would have invested in the rule of law, in institutional building. Have we done so? We, we have not done so whatsoever. In fact, the. the what has happened after 9-11 is that we have made it very clear to the bloody dictators in that part of the world that as long as they cooperate with us in the war on terror, that is basically business uh, as usual. Uh, what's happening, just to give you an idea, uh, what, what's happening to the state itself in that part of the world. I mean, when we say the state, we talk about the state, that basically it, the, the, very, the, 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 the fundamental mission of a state is to do what? is to protect uh, life and liberty and the freedom of its own citizens. All citizens are equal uh, before the law. In that part of the world, the state itself has devolved into what I call a family-based state. What we have in the Middle East are family-based states as opposed to Viberian states, what we think of the state itself, let's say, in democratic-based uh, societies. So you have, in Egypt, you have the Mubarak family estate. After 30 years, President Mubarak is grooming his own son, Gamal Mubarak, to become president. In Yemen, we have the president of Yemen called Ali Abdullah Saleh, 
We have the Ali Abdullah Saleh in Yemen. He's grooming his son to become the next president. In Syria, we have the Assad family-based uh, state. Uh, in Libya, we have the Qaddafi-based state. Muammar Qaddafi, the president of Libya, is grooming his son, Saif al-Islam, to become president. You have family-based states, mafia-like types of regimes, who basically, in fact, they don't care about their own citizens. They don't care about legitimacy. All they care about is obedience by their own citizens. They terrify, terrorize uh, their citizens. Why this is important for us? What does it have to do with my, our own talk about Al-Qaeda and extremism? One of the major reasons, if there is one particular point I really would like you to take home, and my own argument, is that you cannot understand Al-Qaeda, the rise of Al-Qaeda and extremism in that part of the world, without understanding what I call the vacuum of legitimate political authority in that part of the world. The vacuum of legitimate political uh, authority. Today, intolerance and extremism is the norm in the Middle East. Not because it's of a cultural trait, not because Arabs and Muslims are authoritarian as an oppressor, but because you have extremist governments, you have uh, family-based mafia-like states who terrorize their population. There's a huge gap of legitimacy. Citizens don't view their government as legitimate. So what do you have? You have a person like Osama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahi who tried to fill the vacuum of legitimate authority in that part of the world. And that's why when we say that instead of invading Iraq, instead of trying, pretending to promote democracy, we should have invested real capital in institutional building, in economic uh, ventures, in the rule of law, in universities. And this is how you build institutions. This is how you deal with extremism. This is how you help to create alternative, alternative civil societies in that part of the world. Unfortunately, not only we did not do that, in fact, there is a widely held perception in that part of the world that the United States sustains and maintains the oppressive order in that part of the world. I mean, think our relationship with the Mubaraks, our relationship with the various uh, dictators in that part of the world. Not only there is a vacuum of legitimate political authority that sustains and feeds authoritarianism and extremism and Al-Qaeda, the economic and social crisis is, is devastating. And again, I'm going to simplify a great deal, but just give you some ideas what I'm talking about. On average, you have more than 40% of the Arab population live either in poverty or below the poverty line. Either 40% or more than 40% live in poverty or below the poverty line. Egypt. Egypt is the largest Arab state, 80 million people. 49% of Egyptians live either in poverty or below the poverty line. Millions of Egyptians, million of the 82 million Egyptians, wait for hours in line to get six loaves of bread every day, subsidized by the government. In Sudan, 68% of the Sudanese live in poverty or below the poverty line. Yemen, 69%. Lebanon, the most open society supposedly in the Middle East, 40% of the Lebanese people live in poverty or below the poverty line. Unemployment among the young, I mean, young people, the largest in the world, 40%, in particular among the educated uh, young people. So here you have a dismal economic situation. You have a closed political structure. You have political oppression. You have uh, uh, legitimate political authority. And what do you have? In fact, I'm one of those students on the Middle East I am pleasantly surprised, and I might shock you here, I am pleasantly surprised how little violence exists in the Middle East. Think about it. If you had political authoritarianism in that spot, if you have no freedom, if you have no political space, if you have no future, if you have no economic opportunities, think how easy it is for human beings and societies to devolve into extremism and into authoritarianism. In fact, the reality is that Muslim societies are some of the least violent societies in the world given the multiple challenges facing uh, Muslim uh, societies. We don't only have, uh, the Middle East is not just a broken region. It's not just an institutional wasteland. Uh, in fact, the Middle East, most Middle Eastern states are either failed states or are being or on, on, on the way to becoming failed states. As you know, in the last few months, Yemen, there has been a great deal. I don't know if you have paid attention. 
is Yemen a failed state or a failing state? This is the, the, the debate in the United States. I don't start with Yemen. Yemen is a very poor country, the poorest country in the Arab world. 23 million Yemenis, almost 69% of Yemenis are really live. I start with Egypt. Uh, and I, I, I won't just spend two minutes on Egypt. The reason why Egypt is very important because Egypt captured, captures the Arab conditions. 82 mi million people, the, the most populous Arab state. Egypt is Umm Dunya. Egyptian called that country Umm Dunya, the mother of the world. The oldest nation state in the world, 6,000 years. In 1923, Egypt had the most progressive constitution in the world. The Egyptian constitution of 1923 was as progressive as our own constitution, the American constitution. Where is Egypt today? Umm Dunya, the mother of the world, is a broken country. 49% of Egyptians live in poverty. Millions of Egyptians wait hours every day to get six loaves of bread. Nothing works in Egypt except the security forces. Not because they are competent, because you have three million security forces to maintain the family-based state that exists in Egypt. Egypt used to be the cultural capital of the Arab world. By focusing on Egypt, it tells you a great deal where the Arab uh, world is today. I want to conclude, where do we go from here? If my argument is correct, and I might be wrong on this, if, if the heart of the crisis lies in the, what I call the vacuum of legitimate authority, that the relationship between citizens and their own governments, the reason why Osama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahi were able to mobilize a few thousand young Arabs and Muslims, because their governments, I mean, the governments in Egypt and other places are disliked by their own population. You need to close the gap of legitimacy in those societies. How do you do it? You do it by building institutions. You do it by investing in the future of young people in that part of the world. One of the statistics I did not mention is that on average, 70% of the population in that part of the world are below the ages 25 years old. 70% of Iranians are below um, the same way in Egypt, the same way in Yemen, the same way in Iraq. You're talking about uh, major, major problems. There are three, I mean, ideas, three humble, simple ideas I want to leave on the table tonight. The first point is that if my reading is correct, that the crisis that Al-Qaeda is not a threat, Al-Qaeda is part of, of, of it's a tiny, small security irritant, and we can deal with Al-Qaeda not by declaring a global war, but rather by dealing with the root causes of the rise of extremism in that part of the world. We must invest in institutional building. We must invest in the future of hu this huge constituency that exists in that part of the world. How do we do it? We do it by being consistent on the rule of law, on the human rights. We do it by basically keeping a distance from those oppressive rulers basically that oppress their populations. In the eyes, the reason why this is very important, I don't know, I'm sure you know this, most of the people, I mean, there is a widely held perception in that part of the world that the United States maintains the oppressive order in that part of the world, that we are part of the problem, we're not part of the solution. And that's why it's essential for the United States policy in order to be consistent in terms of the rule of law and the human right and so in this particular sense, when President Mubarak comes to Washington, our president, even Barack Obama, embraces uh, President Mubarak and says, whenever we have any kind of challenges, we turn to this wise, ma to this wise man for advice. I mean, think of how Egyptians, those civil society leaders, those progressive voices who are struggling for freedom, think of the United States when our own president basically embraces President Mubarak and says, this is a wise man, this is a friend of the United States of America. Think of it when the United States basically, when elections are corrupted, when human rights advocates are imprisoned and tortured, uh, when civil societies are oppressed, and when the United States does not really utter a single word. Think of what it means, what, how it resonates in that part of the world, consistency consistency on the question of the rule of law and the human rights, tremendous inv structural investments in institutional building in that part of the world. The second point I want to say, if, there is, if my argument is correct, 
that we, the United States, is being blamed for the existing order. There is no way that we can deal with this particular set of perception without dealing with the question of the Arab-Israeli peace process. I know probably you've heard it a million of times. I would argue the most important challenge facing the United States of America in the Middle East today is to find a resolution to the Palestinian tragedy today. I'm not suggesting, please, when I say what I'm talking about is a settlement of a two-state solution, security for Israel and justice for the Palestinians. That is, America's strategic interests lie in finding a comprehensive resolution to the Palestinian-Israeli problem to find, because remember, there is again this widely held perception in that part of the world that the United States is responsible for the Palestinian uh, tragedy, that the United States sustains and maintains the superiority apparatus of the Israeli state, that the United States does not really care for the plight of the Palestinians. Not only Osama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri use and abuse the Palestinian tragedy, the Palestinian tragedy resonates deeply in that part of the world, and the United States, I want you to know, is deeply held responsible for this particular. And I know, as you all well know, President Barack Obama has made it a strategic priority to find a resolution for this particular conflict. Unfortunately, two years later, we know now that Barack Obama has failed, and failed dismally, to basically carry out his pledge to find a resolution to the Palestinian problem. And I, I, in, in this particular sense, uh, this is really a, 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 a lost historic opportunity. A lost historic opportunity because putting an end to the shedding of Jewish and Palestinian blood is truly a priority. By resolving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, you're removing almost 80% of the poison that exists between the United States and the greater Middle East. And finally, the final point I want to say is that American military presence in that part of the world. The United States, again, uh, during the reception, the United States now is a Middle Eastern power. Most of our military forces now are stationed, not just in Afghanistan and Pakistan, but even in the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula. We have almost 200,000 forces stationed. And for us, we play a security role. We provide a security umbrella for uh, the Gulf states in that part of the world. As you well know, our military presence is seen as part of a design on us in order to maintain the existing security and the existing political process. I, I know most of you know this, but up to 1990, 1991, uh, Osama bin Laden, the murderer, he was part of, he was in the same trenches as the United States and the Western Alliance in Afghanistan, up to 1991. It was in 1991 that Osama bin Laden left Saudi Arabia angry because the United States, after it expelled Iraqi forces from Kuwait, decided to station troops in Saudi Arabia. Again, I don't need to remind you what Saudi Arabia means. I mean, it's the land, the birthplace of Islam. It's where the holiest shrines of Islam is in the country. What I am trying to suggest is the presence of American boots in the heart of Arabia and the heart of Islam does a great deal of harm to America's moral standing and America's image and security. I'm not suggesting that it's very easy to do so, but I'm suggesting that we must think to find ways and means to begin the process uh, of, of uh, removing uh, American military boots. Uh, and finally, you might say, well, look, you're asking too much of the United States. Uh, uh, you're asking too much in terms of resources, in terms of commitment. I am not asking too much of, of my country. If, again, if the numbers are correct, the numbers I, I've mentioned to you earlier, if we have spent, think of what, have, what $5 trillion would have done. Think of what $5 trillion would have done to institutional building and economic development and poverty alleviation in the Middle East. Just think about it for a second, and this is not a theoretical question. We are spending on average now $100 billion a year on the war in Afghanistan. Think of what $100 billion would do in terms of, I mean, trying to alleviate some of the problems in bringing about peace, creating the infrastructure uh, of peace. Uh, I'm not asking too much of the United States because if my argument co is correct, if we are a Middle Eastern power, I mean, you know more than I do, we are addicted to Middle Eastern oil. Literally addicted, all of us are addicted. 
Uh, that is, uh, this is not a theoretical question that we have deeply vested interests in that part of the world. That is, what I am trying to suggest is that since we will be there in the next 50 years, because I don't think uh, our leadership is thinking the creation of alternative sources of energy and trying to extract the United States from the region. I think uh, our interests lie in institutional building, in investing in the future of the young people in the region who blame the United States for maintaining the oppressive order in the region, in trying to broker a settlement that basically provides Israel with security and justice for the Palestinians. And I really believe that neglecting these particular ideas basically will be very disastrous for the United States in the long term. Thank you. We have a lot of questions that have been emailed to us, but not a lot of time for answers. Um, so I would ask Professor Jurgis um, if he could be as concise and brief as possible in his responses so we can get to all of these questions. Uh, question number one. Uh, in your opinion, how should President George Bush have responded after the 9-11 attacks for the duration of his presidency in order to oppose terrorism and reduce global tensions? I mean, I think I, I insinuated uh, to what we should have done after 9-11. I think tragic as it was, bloody as it was, painful as it was, we should have used 9-11 as a catalyst for transformation. We should have used the catalyst of 9-11 to bridge the divide between us and that part of the world. We should not have invaded Iraq, we should have really invested resources in putting an end to the shedding, put a stop to the shedding of Jewish and Palestinian blood. Uh, in, in, in investing, we, of course, we had to deal with Al-Qaeda, uh, expelling the, the ousting the, the Taliban from Afghanistan, we should at least have, I mean, kept our eyes on, on the prize in Afghanistan and made sure that uh, Afghanistan functioned as a state uh, and, and built the institution of Afghanistan itself. We should not have fought the war on the same terms as Ayman Zawahiri want us to fight the war, to lash out angrily in the Middle East, and that's exactly what we did. What responsibility does the moderate Muslim community have for communicating to Muslim extremists that the use of terrorism is not only unacceptable, but damaging to Muslims as a whole? Uh, th th this is a very important question, and this is truly a very, very, I mean, complex question. Because remember, after 9-11, the biggest question in the United States after 9-11 was, why do they hate us so much? You remember the question is that, uh, I mean, think of the question itself. Why do they hate us so much? Who are, who are we talking about? Are we talking about Al-Qaeda? Are we talking about Osama bin Laden, Ayman Zawahi? Or are we talking about the Muslim community as a whole, the 1.1 uh, uh, billion uh, Muslims? Uh, in my book, uh, The Far Enemy, uh, and uh, Provost mentioned my book, The Far Enemy, Why Jihad uh, Went to Global. I have 60 pages, truly 60 pages, basically documenting the Muslim response to 9-11 and the attacks against Al-Qaeda. 60 pages. On the morning after, the top clerics and leaders in the Muslim world, they're shocked uh, uh, by the attacks on the United States. When I went to the Middle East, and many of us, truly, I had never seen such outpouring of, 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 of uh, basically empathy for the American victims after 9-11. Uh, I want you to know, and I know it's easy said than done, most of the victims of Al-Qaeda and extremism have been Muslims, not Americans or Westerners. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Muslims have been killed as a result of terrorism, not just, of course, I'm not, such, I'm, I'm not really minimizing uh, the tragedy uh, of 9-11. Uh, but at the same time, if we listen carefully if we paid really adequate attention to the debate that was taking place, and I mean, I, I, I can throw names uh, 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 and, and mention all the clerics. Uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, Yusuf Qardawi, Atantawi, uh, at turabi all the, I mean, I'm talking about the morning after 9-11, basically severely criticized Al-Qaeda and said that Al-Qaeda basically violated the very ethics of Islam 
and the institution of jihad in the Muslim world, truly. Uh, and this is, was part of the entire campaign after 9-11. The reason why, and I, I, I'm not suggesting there was a conspiracy, but I think there are two narratives, two narratives after 9-11 competed uh, uh, in the United States. One narrative said, well, look, Al-Qaeda was an isolated and insidious, a small movement. And another narrative said, no, Al-Qaeda was part of a broader ideological threat that the United States and the West faces. Remember what President Bush uh, said about Islamofascism. I mean, the whole notion is that Al-Qaeda is part of a broader Islamofascism. And think of it, how many Americans really made the distinction between Islam and Islamofascism or Islamism? In the minds of many Americans, I mean, Islamofascism was really synonymous with, well, uh, the polls are devastating. I don't need to tell you, most of you, uh, uh, I mean, a majority of Americans now uh, the way they view Islam, I mean, the debate over the entire Muslim Cultural Center in New York truly exposed what I call the cultural reverberations of the war on terror. I mean, I mentioned a great deal about all the, I mean, the costs of the war on terror. I did not mention the cultural damage that has taken place that has occurred in the United States itself. How Americans view the blinders that we have when it comes, and I, I'm, I'm talking, by the way, uh, I, I've never, I'm not a Muslim, so I, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying, Truly, if you look at, at, at the strategic landscape in the Muslim world itself and how Muslims responded to 9-11, you realize that the narrative that portrayed the Muslim community as basically accountable as part of Al-Qaeda, I mean, here you have some top commentators uh, during the, the, the debate on the Islamic Cultural Center by saying they attacked us on 9-11. Uh, again, major on ABC television, they attacked us on 9-11. Who attacked us on 9-11? Um, I mean, the same Al-Qaeda that attacked the United States on 9-11 killed tens of thousands of Iraqis. Actually, uh, more than tens of thousands of Iraqis. Uh, they're massacring Muslims, I mean, en masse. Uh, but uh, this, is, this particular question tells you a great deal. I'm not suggesting, I'm not suggesting that the, the, the debate should not really be uh, uh, more intense. I'm not suggesting that Muslims should not really basically engage in a greater debate about the future of the Muslim community. I don't need to tell you there is a fierce struggle taking place in the Muslim world. Uh, we, don't, I don't, we don't need to preach to Muslims. You just go to Egypt, you go to even Pakistan, you go to Iran, you go to Turkey, you realize Muslims are debating their own societies. Muslims are trying to basically delegitimize Al-Qaeda. And, and this, you asked me the first question, the most effective means to basically delegitimize Al-Qaeda was to basically build alliances with Muslim moderates in order to slay the beast. What one thing could US citizens do to put pressure on our government to help bring peace to the Middle East? Well, uh, <coughs> I, I think, I, again, I don't need to tell you one of the reasons why our voices are not really being heard, is that we really don't take the time and the energy and the effort to educate ourselves as you know, citizens in a democracy. And, and this is a cliche. Uh, I mean, think of how much, I mean, I think we lost the debate after 9-11. I don't think the reason why we found ourselves in the killing fields of Iraq, because we lost the debate on whether the United States should have really uh, expanded the war on terror and invaded Iraq. Because not too many Americans took the time to educate themselves about the costs, about the implications, about the challenges, about the nature of the threat uh, that Al-Qaeda faced uh, after 9-11. Not too many Americans took the time to, to investigate whether um, Iraq had a hand in 9-11. Uh, not too many Americans took the time to really make the distinction between Islam and Islamofascism. Not just between Islam, and Al-Qaeda, but between Islamists, mainstream Islamists, and uh, militant extremists. Um, I think uh, in a democracy, unless we take charge, unless we really become deeply involved, um, and I would argue that if there is one particular thing that we should do, is that we should really uh, become part of the political process. Uh, we should engage uh, both on the local community and the national uh, community. I mean, I, I want to hear, I, it's, I know, uh, think when we talk about the peace process. I mean, how many of you, when you hear uh, the, the Palestinian-Israeli question, there's always the question that is somehow 
the lobby, the Israeli lobby, basically is opposed to the peace process, and by implication, Israel's friends. All the polls that we have seen, and we were talking about earlier, a majority of the Jewish people in the United States, more than 60% of the Jewish community in the United States, support a two-state solution that is one Palestinian state and one Israeli state based on international consensus. Uh, here you have, I mean, the lobby itself basically speaks, I mean, pretends, claims to speak for the Jewish community in the United States, yet it really does not speak for the Jewish community. If there's one thing I would like to see, I would like to see more Jewish voices in the political debate. I want to see more and more Jews taking really charge and basically becoming involved and letting their voice be heard because their voices are the voices of peace. And final point on this particular sense, I think we need to become truly, we need to become part of the constituency of peace in the United States, all of us. When we say, when I say the Jewish community, I'm saying all of us, we should part of a coalition, a coalition that basically promotes and argues and debates and fights for peace. Uh, and I think truly, if, if we, I don't think we can really rely on our governments anymore because governments basically have their own uh, interests, their own vast interests and their own concerns. And unless we as citizens become involved, I mean, mobilize ourselves in a coalition of peace, I don't think uh, we're going to find our, this will going to break this particular deadly embrace that exists between the United States and that part of the world. Well, most of these remaining questions you've already touched upon, but I think some of them are worth uh, exploring in some greater detail. How much involvement do most of the Middle Eastern countries want from the U.S.? And where and why does most of the resentment come from? Uh, I mean, there are two questions here. You have about, you're talking about Muslim governments. That is, you're talking about Arab and Muslim leaders. Um, Arab and Muslim leaders do not really want the United States to become involved in their societies whatsoever. President Mubarak, once we provide, we have provided Egypt with, and we provide Israel with $3.1 billion a year, and we give Egypt about $2.2 billion dollars a year. President Mubarak wants the money, but he does not really want any involvement in Egypt at all. So when the most recent elections took place in Egypt, I don't know if you followed, if you, there were parliamentary ele elections in Egypt a few weeks ago. And again, the ruling Nationalist Party won 90% of the vote. 90% of the vote, the United States said, we are deeply concerned about the situation in Egypt. President Mubarak, foreign minister, said, how dare you? Uh, we are a democracy. Our elections are, were transparent and genuine. The end of the story. Uh, neither Mubarak, uh, nor the Saudis, uh, nor the Yemenis. A few days ago, now we are providing Yemen. We just provided Yemen every year now with one, $160 uh, million uh, for security, for counterterrorism, because Al-Qaeda has emerged as, as a, you know, an important uh, outlet in Yemen. Uh, so the ruling party of Yemen passed a resolution a few days ago uh, for the president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, for life. They passed a legislation that he is now he can run for life. So our uh, secretary, one of our, the secretary of state spokesperson said, we are deeply concerned about the legislation that was introduced by the ruling party in Yemen. And then the spokesperson of the Yemeni president said, how dare you, you interfere in Yemeni domestic politics? Uh, this is it, that is of course, uh, uh, but surely, but surely when we provide money, when I say that we should really have a say, when we provide Israel with $3.1 billion a year, we have a moral responsibility. If Israel's actions affect the security interests of the United States, we have a responsibility and duty to tell the Israelis, your actions affect the security, the strategic security interest of the United States. You must behave or otherwise we would not provide you with the most sophisticated technology in order to do damage to America's security. When we provide Mubarak with $2.2 billion a year, if Mubarak oppresses his population and basically does what he does, we should tell the Egyptian people we do not support the actions of the Mubarak government. This is not in our name. Uh, but the reality is because not only we provide the money, the money is really secondary. We provide the political and moral support that sustain the existing bloody regimes in that part of the world. That's why there's a widely held perception 
in that part of the world that we sustain and maintain the oppressive order in, in that part of the world. I mean, think of the dominant. They say, if you ask anyone in the Middle East, they say, if it was not, if it's not for the United States, the existing ruling uh, uh, establishment would not remain in power. In fact, one of the major reasons of Al-Qaeda, and I, I, I alluded to it in my talk, is that one of the reasons why Osama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahi wanted to expel the United States from the Middle East was to do what? They wanted to equalize the playing field. Because once the United States is out of Muslim lands, it becomes easier targets for Osama bin Laden in Saudi Arabia, for Ayman Zawahiri in Egypt, and other in Algeria. So on the one hand, Middle Eastern leaders do not really want the United States to have a say in the domestic politics or in the, on the question of civil society and the rule of law, but their own populations, Muslim, in particular the young, the largest con constituency, believes that the United States is basically plays a key role in retaining the status quo in that part of the world. And that's why we have to reverse this particular deadly cycle. That is, does our interest, I mean the question for all of us here, do our interests lie in maintaining the corrupt and authoritarian order that has really brought us to 9-11? Or are, do our interests lie in a different order, in a more progressive order? I'm not suggesting, I'm not naive, I'm not suggesting that we can change and transform the Middle East overnight, but we must begin the process of investment in civil societies, investment in human rights and the rule of law. I don't think we're asking too much of our leaders if, they, if, we, if we say you must be consistent on the rule of law, when governments anywhere in the world, not just in the Middle East, violate the basic rights of their citizens, this is the United States of America, we say we are the leader of the free world. We are the leader of human rights. It is a sacred responsibility. Uh, I mean, and that's why our responsibilities come in as citizens. But many Americans really, for a variety of reasons, because some of us are very lazy, you know, uh, we don't really take the time to educate ourselves and really become engaged both in the local community and the national community as well. How do militant Islamists, uniquely among terrorist and resistant groups, manage to recruit so many suicide volunteers? Uh, they really don't. I know. I mean, think of the, of the portrait I tried to paint tonight in the sense of this dismal economic situation. Uh, I, I, I mean, let me give you an idea what, what, what I'm talking about. In just, I mean, here you have Cairo. Cairo is a city that was constructed for about 2 million people. You have now almost 22 million people who live in Cairo. Uh, you have 2 million people who live in cemeteries you have three million people on, on the ceilings of building. Uh, you have what we call the urban poverty belts in Cairo, in Algeria, in, 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 in Beirut, in other places. You have 10 million, I mean, young people who live in the urban poverty belts mm -hmm. in Cairo alone. Um, not only you have a, a, a dismal economic and social situation, you have also oppressive political conditions where the state itself oppresses its population. Um, in fact, to come back to the argument I made earlier, truly, and I know this is a silly argument, as a student of the social sciences, as students of the social movement, I am really pleasantly surprised how little violence exists in that part of the world. Uh, and the way they recruit, it's, it's very easy, it's very simple. I mean, think about it. If you, I mean, uh, to give you an idea, if you, if you read Arabic and Middle Eastern newspapers, if you listen to Al Jazeera, if you see what's happening in Arab societies, uh, I don't know in the last few days, if you have seen the news in Algeria, uh, in Tunis, all the riots, I mean, uh, riots, uh, mm -hmm. uh, poverty, it's really much easier than you think. Uh, um, I mean, variety of reasons, uh, uh, ideological mobilization, uh, the promises that uh, your very identity is at stake uh, the whole notion of suicide bombing really is, is what I call some identity question. That is basically those kids who are joining these particular organizations believe that their very identity, Islamic identity, is under threat. And they're, they're basically they must do everything in their power to protect. Of course, they're diluted, they're isolated, uh, and of course, they're indoctrinated. Um, and, and this is why you have this tiny, and I, a, a tiny group of young men who subscribe 
to this particular uh, ideology. Let just one more footnote on this particular question. Let's take Iraq. I want to just stress, just flesh out what I mean by the question of identity. Take the question of Iraq before 2003. Iraq never, Iraq never witnessed a single suicide bombing before 2003. Not even a single suicide bombing. After 2003, after the US-led invasion and occupation of Iraq, Iraq has witnessed more than three or 4,000 suicide bombings. Just, I just want to give you an idea. The question for me as a social scientist, how can I ignore, how can I neglect, how can I minimize the role of shattering crisis like a foreign invasion of a country and its impact on the social fabric of society? A country that never witnessed a single suicide bombing, yet in two, three years, thousands of suicide bombings have taken place in this country. What does it tell you? I don't have to be an expert on Iraq. It tells you that you have ideological mobilization, you have a large number of people who believe that their very society, very culture, their very identity is under threat, that foreign invaders basically are mutilating their identity. Uh, and that's why you have, I mean, if it was not for logistical persons, I would tens of thousands of suicide bombings because they buy into the argument that their identity, Islamic identity, their culture, their society, their religion is under attack. And let's say, please, I, I hope you understand, I'm not in any way trying to rationalize this bloody thing. I'm trying to really understand why a country like Iraq that had never witnessed suicide bombings before the American-led invasion now is basically engulfed in thousands of suicide bombings. Well, we've arrived at the final question, and in many ways this is the question that you addressed in your main talk, but I think it's worth asking again, um, giving you an opportunity to perhaps um, go in a different direction or summarize what you've already said. Where do we go from here? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I, first of all, I want to say, really, and qualify what I said. It's very easy for us, we academics, to really bark and to pontificate and to say that government should do this and do that. It's very easy to sit down here and say that Barack Obama should basically twist the arms of the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and basically force Netanyahu to suspend the building of settlements. It's very easy to say that Barack Obama should twist the arms of Mubarak and force President Hosni Mubarak to behave in Egypt. It's very easy for us to say that President Barack Obama should invest in institutional building in Egypt and other places where we know that the governments would not really welcome American money if American money basically would undermine the foundation of those existing regimes. Uh, but let me say that I don't think this is a luxury anymore. Uh, it's no luxury anymore because the Middle East now, I mean, we are a Middle Eastern power. Uh, we will be in the Middle East at least for 50 years. Uh, most of the oil resources exist in that part of the world. Uh, we have now almost 200,000 forces, through. most of the American troops now have moved from Europe after World War II into the Middle East. And even if we want to really, the Middle East now has come to American shores after 9-11. That is the whole notion of 9-11. And that's why I think what we really, what, what we need to have is a debate on the Middle East. Uh, a debate on American foreign policy in the Middle East. To what extent has American, and I, I want to be blunt, how much are we responsible for unleashing some of these extremist movements in that part of the world? That is, to what extent has our foreign policy sowed the seeds to what, partially or not, that is, does American foreign policy, and I really want to, I want to be blunt here, does American foreign policy in that part of the world reflect our own ethos, the ethos of the founding fathers of the United States? Should we really go to bed with those bloody dictators who oppress their own population? Should we fund and sponsor and finance the building of settlements on the West Bank and East Jerusalem? Should we provide Israel with 3.1 billion dollars a year when Israel itself does not really believe in its own security and does not really believe in a settlement that takes into account its own security and the strategic interests of the United States. That is, what kind of foreign policy, what kind of, 
what kind of America, how are we going to really see ourselves vis-a-vis -vis that part of the world? I think, in a way, and that's why I believe we cannot rely on our policymakers. I think we should have ourselves become deeply engaged and also have engaged in a debate about what kind of foreign policy the United States should have vis-a-vis -vis that part of the world. So, thank you. Thanks for having me. So.